You are listening to and watching the Scars and Guitars podcast series that syndicates for the A-List Online. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. Thanks for joining me. Yes, if you're listening to the podcast, you heard that right. I do have an edit of this available on YouTube. Do please check it out. Give me some feedback. As many of you know, I'm easily found and I do communicate and correspond. So there you go. The interview subjects, though, that I want to share with you on this particular installment of the broadcast are from the Netherlands. Marlon Waltrink and Rene Aquarius, they comprise the duo Plague Organ. They have an extraordinary release out called Orphan, and that's the catalyst for the conversation. I received a demo from Sentient Ruin, one of the many that I received through the week, but this one is irresistible for all of the reasons that you'll hear about throughout the conversation. Just before we get to it though, and I don't do this that often, I don't like playing too much music on the show, but I'm going to share a snippet just so that you've got an understanding of the type of, I don't even know whether you could call it music to be honest, it's just oral soundscapes, but it's done in such a way that is near to genius in my opinion. Have a listen. Okay, you heard it. So let's get to it. Here they are, Marlon Waltrink and Rene Aquarius from Plague Organ. I'm so impressed no with the music that you've put together on this thing. I've never heard anything like it, to be quite honest with you, which is really <laughs> saying something for me as a muso and having done 600 interviews at this point. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, um, it's also hard for us to know what we actually made because uh, we have the same problem when when we were done uh, recording the album and listening back to it, um, we were like, who the hell are we going to send this to? And what are we going to say about this album to a label? Because uh, what do we compare this to? It, it is quite difficult to categorize it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I've got to tell you, I think it's the most unique music that I've certainly heard all year, but certainly in a decade, ever since I first heard, say, Portal and Trepanering's Ritual, and I haven't heard anything that's had that much of an impact on the way that I listen to music. It's actually changed the way that I'll approach music from now on, knowing that you can actually push the boundaries this far as what the pair of you have been able to do. You know, the, the most compelling comparison that I think I can make for people that will be listening to this because this will be part of my podcast series is that it's black metal meets Brian Eno during a very dark acid trip with all of the <laughs> connotations that implies. So, I mean, for the, for the uninitiated and for those people who just listen to Mayhem and Satyricon and your, your garden variety black metal fan or your music fan even beyond that, it's probably just noise, to be honest, because I've seen some comments online about that, but they just don't get it. And it's polarising. I assume you've seen some of the comments online about it too. People either love it or they hate it, but it's incredibly profound listening experience once you stay with it. And I think that's what you've got to do. The first time you hear it, you go, oh, my God. But up to i think i've listened to it about 50 or 60 times now oh jesus christ yeah <laughs> i mean I listened to it for four months or something continue i listened i've listened to it probably three or four times a day ever since i got it which was about wow um, three weeks ago or so now yeah so damn because because it's 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 got its hooks in me it's really got its hooks in me and Every time I hear it, I can hear new things. And that's even after the 50th and 60th listen. So it's, so it's very dense. It's very layered. Mm -hmm. It's multi-textured. But, the, you know, the most profound thing that I can, I can say that it does is I listen to it when I'm going to sleep. I have it on repeat. And when I'm in that semi-dream state, it induces okay. hallucinations. Oh. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's, well, thanks for the kind of words because, yeah, it's great to hear how people actually listen to the album and what they get out of it so that's yeah that's great and of course yeah uh, the comments uh, that you mentioned that you see online it's basically with every release like some cater to a bigger audience of course than others so they are more popular but in the end it's with every release not everything is for everybody and that's totally cool at least you know when people say it's boring or when they don't understand it at least they took the time to listen to it, which is already great because what more can we ask for? I mean, if people listen to it and don't like it, that's okay. If 
people don't listen to it and say they don't like it, that's something I have a, more of a problem with because it's basically based on uh, misconceptions. But uh, yeah, if, if people like uh, the, the, the album, that's great. If they listen and they don't like it, that's cool too. I mean, there are so many bands and music out there. You can always find something you'd like. Very true. So the obvious question and the next question for you is how on earth did you do this? As I say, it's, it's one, you know, it's, it's so dense and so layered. It either took, it's a single take or it either took you about a thousand takes to get right. It can't have been in between. It's, it's, it is actually somewhere in between. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got we did not, well, uh, first, we did not set out to make the most aggressive or uh, psychedelic album ever. That's not our intent. We had a few ideas to work with. And uh, what was done in a few takes was actually Rene's drums. He did about three takes continuously of the entire track of 40 minutes long. So what you hear is actually really live. Um, we had a concept for, of, of something about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and we thought, okay, that, that is our basis for the entire track to work off. It was the choir you hear, the, the voice, uh, the, the uh, cerebral voices you hear in the track. Um, René had the idea to play a good blast beat on it to, get, to keep momentum. So there was something really nice. So he played that for 40 minutes, something mm. three times, completely exhausted. <laughs> this is how it started out. René, can you chime in? Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's true. Uh, what we basically did is uh, uh, the vocal samples that, that the album starts with, that was the, the beginning of it. Then we uh, uh, laid on top of that the uh, drums. And after we had that basis, we thought, okay, it needs more. But we didn't want to add like a standard uh, electric guitar, uh, like to get a metal vibe out of it because it was already sounding quite metal, but not in the typical sense. Um, so we discussed what can we do? And we came up with, yeah, let's just add bass but also not in a traditional sense, but yeah. uh, just riffing along with the blast beat. And that's what Malon did uh, on top of what we already had. So uh, I think you did it in, that was a single take, like a continuous take. And you just, I remember you sitting in the studio, playing, playing, playing for 40 minutes, you know, getting totally numb, but uh, in the end, I think that was really important but because what we didn't want to do was um, a 10 second sample or a minute sample and then just copy paste because it, it, it was possible to do it like that. But I think, uh, and what you also talked about, Andrew, the most important thing is the micro differences uh, in from minute to minute. Mm -hmm. So it's, it isn't copy paste, a copy paste ordeal. It's just, us playing it live and the little variations that it brings along makes it interesting. Yeah, very interesting to say the very to say the least. And and let me just qualify: like Sentient Ruin sent me through the uh, the album weeks ago, so that's how I've been able to listen to it so much. I assume it's only just been released for the for the general public or thereabouts. But look, I yeah. get sent tens of things a week, and it's I'll, I'll give everything one listen. I can tell you that, and yours got me. Very unusual experience with yours. It got me on the first listen as it keeps on getting me on the 50 and 60th listen. And I, I suppose I can absolutely hear, I'm a musician myself, if you can't tell behind me here. Yeah, uh, yeah, bass. Bass. yeah. Yeah, nice. yeah, that's it. Bass and bass and a bit of guitar, a bit of, bit of kids' drums here too. My daughter's playing my, the drums over there too, trying to get them oh, that's great. involved yeah. from a young age, you know. But I could hear that it wasn't uh, copy and pasted. You didn't pro tool it. In other words, you know, you might have recorded it with Pro Tools or thereabouts, but or a program similar. However, I could hear that it was, especially with your drums, Renee, I could hear through the slight variations. And it's that attention to detail that I truly appreciate that the both of you were focused on with this release here, because I suppose it would be fairly easy for 
lesser musicians and engineers to do something like this as a concept, but then just do say five minutes and then just layer it, bang, 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 and make it a cut and paste job. You haven't done that. You've actually paid attention to it from the perspective that it is a unified body of work as only musicians can do. So you can't demo this sort of stuff, I assume. So when you were actually recording it, did you actually have a strategy or did it just unfold? Uh, like I said, we had that, that 15, 17 minutes base, basis to work off. Um, our concept was uh, to, to play the track. We want uh, an earplay for 40 minutes. So that was our uh, complete intention and do as little as possible edits. Um, and then we listened to the track over and over and over, maybe just as often as you did, and <laughs> made, sh- made sure uh, we, we focused on keeping the flow. Just keeping a flow, just not like I said, no copy pasting and stuff like that. So mm. if we, we we created the vocal track, it changes throughout the entire track. It stays quite the same, but it changes. It's in, in no spot. It's exactly the same. It's slight variations all over. And we did add small and little things just to make sure the flow the flow keeps flowing, so to, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So a little uh, flageolet of a guitar and a deep bass note somewhere, just all by feel. It's not, uh, there's no uh, verse, there's no uh, chorus. It just keeps going. So it's entire, every time we listen through it and we feel, okay, here's a spot, it needs something. Then we did something. So it took yeah. a lot of listens and a lot of a lot of listens and re-listens and how does it feel? Do we both think it's cool? Well, we, that's how yeah. we approach the entire track. Yeah, and and I think what's also important we um, every time we added something to the mix, we just let the music lead us. We didn't have a, a preconception of uh, what it would be like. It would. It, like Marlon said, it's not about the most aggressive or the most psychedelic album, but it's just whatever we think the music needs, we just let the music speak for itself and try to go with that. So, Renee, with the drums, I, I love the cadence of the beat. You're, you're, you're on it, but occasionally you go slightly behind, and I love that as a bassist, okay, because too many drummers play slightly in front of the beat, and for me as a bassist, it's almost impossible to lay a, a solid groove down, and I know that's not what yeah, you're yeah. trying to do here, but you can't change the internal rhythms, you know, th- those, those rhythms that we each have inside ourselves as musicians. Did you... I feel as though it's... Sli- the more I listen to it, the music feels tribal, and that's primarily coming from your drums. So this, the average person might listen to it and go, oh, it sounds like Hellhammer or any one of those other great black metal percussionists. But to me, I'm getting a, a slight tribal vibe. Now, it could be because, again, I've listened to it so much and I'm getting into a bit of a trance state with it all. But with, with the drumming side of things, were you influenced by anybody specifically? Or is this just all you? Oh, I can say Ooh, it's all it's Renee. Always... It's all Renee, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> That's it's it's sure. difficult. I, I it, it's funny because when I listen to a band, I of course always pay more attention to the drummer. Uh, I did that from since I was a kid, but um, I never really had like drumming heroes or like there are people I respect by, of course. But I think in the end, it's just something I really enjoy to hear the drums. And so it's, it's somewhere deep inside of me, I guess. And, but it, it's not that I'm, that I can say like this drummer influenced we, me most, or uh, this is the guy I worship. It's, it's not like that. Uh, yeah. I, I think and it's, yeah, mostly f- from inside, I guess. How do you keep the metronome pace that you do? Because it doesn't go in and out. It's as I say, it's either slightly on the beat or it's it's just slightly behind it. But I feel like that's intentional with you. So a lot of drummers, and God knows how many drummers that I've played with, and to be honest with you, most don't have a sense of this beat. Like they need to wear the click track, whether especially when we're playing in the studio, but sometimes when we're playing live as well, especially when there's a backing track. Okay. Mm-hmm. But for yeah. you, it sounds like as though 40 minutes, it feels like as though you could have played for an extra 20 minutes and you could have kept the beat going. So is there a, is there a, a like a technique that you're deploying that you can share? Or again, is it just all you, is it just all the way that you decided to play drums? I, uh, it's, it's been a while, but I, I, I didn't play this with a click track. It's just 
uh, mm. like you said, the internal rhythm. And I guess this is my internal rhythm. It's for my other bands. I do repetitive stuff. I, I guess that's something I really like to do. Um, but in the end, uh, so I got kind of used to playing a single thing for prolong, uh, a prolonged time. So say 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So usually I'm quite focused on keeping things steady and trying to go with my feeling uh, because usually that's, if I do that, then it leads to the, the best results. If I try to focus too much on like, oh, I, I can't go too fast, I can't go too slow, uh, then if, if I'm focused too much on that, then usually it it's goes wrong. But if I'm just listening to the, the feeling I have when playing, then usually that's it's the best take. So that's why I don't like uh, playing with uh, click track and stuff like that. Mm. Um, it, it gets me too distracted on playing something that doesn't feel right. And um, yeah, maybe it's what you say. Like sometimes I, I go a little bit behind and it just feels like the right thing to do. Mm. Hey, so Marlon, how did, how did you capture everything then? Cause I, I think it's your studio that the, mm-hmm. the, it was done in. So we, did you approach this very differently than say a lot of the other work you've done? Because you, from the looks of things on your website, you get some pretty standard looking rock bands in there as well. So was this any also, different yeah. to, yeah, was this completely different to the way you normally approach your work? There are some basic things which apply to every session for sure. Um, we did, um, when recording this blast beat of Renee's, we did uh, think let's let's keep it simple let's keep it very simple so the drums are recorded with five mics i think uh the o- there are not even a real overhead it's more like a combined uh room overhead microphone for the cymbals and the drum kit we did use uh close mics for the snare and the bass drum just to be sure we had something to 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 uh, pull up in the mix if needed so in that regard it's almost old school how it was recorded so like like 70s or maybe even 60s not not mm. not because we want to do an old school sound but because we focused on let's try this for for this sound and not not uh, create a very clinical analytical drum sound like for instance a lot of metal bands have so it's a bit more roomy it's more pummeling uh it fits the style for sure because it's it's, 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 it's continuous groove just going on and going on and on so a bit more of, of a uh, actually tribal sounds was very fitting mm-hmm. cool yeah and who has you... birds oh it's just as me sorry yeah we live in a semi-rural area here so near the cane fields you can hear the they're called plovers oh that's great everywhere. this <laughs> doesn't sound like dutch birds to me so they said this, this, no it's no, no, no. Bird for me. this big and they've got hooks on the end of their wings and if the kids go near them they flap their wings around and try to attack them they're like every bloody animal in australia they're trying to kill you in some way shape or form. <laughs> holy shit <laughs> <laughs> You know, and they get they get when it's coming into nesting season, so that's why you can hear them now because it's it's seven oh, fifteen yeah. p.m. my time, and they they so usually cool, in bed by scary. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you got have you guys been to Australia before? Never. Nope. Nope. Well, there are there are one a lot day, of Dutch people day, in but... Australia. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of the, in, in Brisbane in particular. There's a lot of Dutch people and Dutch heritage people, I should say as well. I'm a, I'm a mm-hmm. Toastmasters with a guy who was born in Holland. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we, we Dutch travel the world. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Spreading the love, spreading the love. So, so uh, just, yeah, <laughs> let's call it like that. <laughs> we, one thing that I, again, just wearing my musician's hat and having done a few sessions myself, it sounds like as though you tracked this and then you lived with it for a bit. In other words, you, you, you had it and before you sent it off to be mastered, you let it, stew for a little while and then probably made some changes after you maybe completed tracking. Is that the case? Uh, we, how long did we work on this? Two years? Three uh, years? Yeah, that, it's interesting. It's uh, something like two or three years. Uh, it, so it, it was a continuous process of recording something, listening to it over and over, uh, getting back together again, like a couple of months afterwards, di- discussing what does it need? and just rinse and repeat 
And that's what we did for really years, <laughs> which is quite mm. a weird way to work. But that's, yeah, that's the way the album came together. This gives, uh, this gave us uh, not on purpose, but this gave us the the, uh, the 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 right perspective to work on a track. Because if you do it in a very short of time, you usually just fool with one thing. We because we did it over this extended period, we were uh, pretty much able to pinpoint what was needed fairly okay. easily. Actually, it was very nice. Not on purpose, but it worked really well. Yeah. This is, yeah, I'll say it again. I think I've said it three or four times through the conversation already, but it's such a profound release, this one here. I think people, and I don't say this often, but I think people are going to be picking this this album up, this song up, because so. it's really yeah. a song that is an album up in 20 years' time. Mm. I think it's, it's going to be that impactful for you guys. So uh, have you gotten people like myself, have people, because it's, as I say, I've been so comp compelled to reach out to Sentient Ruin then they got in touch with you guys. But have you had other indie journo types do the same thing that they've just gone, holy shit, this is just unlike anything else? Uh, only in, uh, in writing. We saw a few, we read a few blogs, which were actually really, really good. Yeah, people seem very positive about the album uh, up to now. And... Um, I also had a, a couple of friends uh, reach out to me. Like I, uh, I'm involved in a lot of music, and usually uh, friends like your Facebook post or whatever. But now I even had a, a couple of friends like actually writing me a message, like, "Whoa, this release is really cool, and uh, I want to buy the tape." And so yeah, I was quite surprised because in the end, it's just like a very extreme album on all accounts, and. Yeah, people seem to to dig it, and also it's selling quite nice on uh, uh, on the label. Uh, uh, the, the the label guy said, "Yeah, I'm I'm gonna make 100 tapes. Uh, we can be happy if we sell them all." And now, yeah, we already uh, done with the, the the second batch of tapes. We're almost out, and uh, he wants to do a, a final release of it as well. So yeah, oh man, unreal. It's, yeah, it's it's it's. it's I didn't expect any of this, to be honest. So it's yeah. a very nice surprise. Well, congratulations to both of you on it. No, I've ordered the Thanks. tape, by the way, the cassette tape, because I've got a cassette player and I love listening to cassette tapes. And, and I, I can't wait to get it on vinyl as well when you guys do that. And it's, it's got that, that quality. It's almost, I, was, I meant to ask this question earlier, Marlon, but it's almost got an analog quality to it. I understand it's probably been recorded digitally, but mm -hmm. was, did you have an intent to try to capture the sound? So as it sounded analog? No. Uh, I can, can, can uh, create an entire discussion about how, what analog is, but uh, it is recorded digitally, but it is recorded through analog gear. That's for okay. sure. And there's, there is a lot of saturation and distortions happening, but not in the obvious, uh, let me, I have a guitar distortion way. So it's, it's more subtle. It's more like uh, it makes the sound a bit fatter, maybe more analog. Maybe that is what you re, uh, describe as tape, tape sound. Hmm. It's, 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 it's the saturation thing what is happening in the entire track. The other thing too is the artwork is is perfect for the music you guys have come up with there. So who who did you work with there and how did you decide on what the album art concept would be? It was uh, created uh, yeah, by... Yeah, uh, it's uh, done by... Uh, oh. No, no, you go yeah. ahead. It's, it's done by, by uh, uh, Stefan uh, uh, Tanner. Uh, he's... Um, he was part of Chaos Echoes. If you don't know that band, uh, it's a fantastic band. They have released a couple of albums and they ended with a live album last year, which uh, has been released on Utech Records. Uh, so if you haven't picked it up, uh, go and do it because it's really great. Um, and he's a fantastic artist. He, he worked with uh, yeah a lot of bigger metal bands also uh, skeleton witch for example uh, oh, yeah. succumb yeah. which came out on uh, flanzer records uh, he did the cover art for that one as well and uh, yeah I, I knew him a little bit so uh, malone and i discussed it and uh, we said yeah he has a great style let's ask him so we asked if he was available and uh, yeah he he felt really happy to do it and uh, we sent him like a, a rough mix at first to 
get a, gr a grasp of what we were doing. And uh, yeah, he liked it. So um, we, we just gave him the music, we gave him the lyrics and we said, please do something with this. Uh, the choice is yours. You're the, the artist. I'm sure you can, uh, you can make this work. And uh, yeah, he came up with this beautiful artwork, which was also kind of new for him because it's a style he usually never works in and also it's quite colorful. Mm. So he was really happy uh, with the end result as well because it was all new for him. So yeah, I think it all really worked out very nicely. It's a complete package and because we're in this bloody COVID-19 lockdown situation where we can't play live and you guys can't even probably get out and even talk to people about it. You've got to do this sort of thing here. Is, is yeah. there a strategy for promoting the album? I know you've got some stuff out there online through Sentient Ruin and the like, but you know, I know it's not the type of album too that you could reproduce live with musicians and the like. So an album like this, I don't, this is the first time I'm saying this as well through this period, because there's been so many great albums this year that were recorded last year. I've obviously, planned last year for release this year, not realizing COVID would happen and they're falling through the cracks. In other words, people don't even know that they're out there because especially alternative and rock and heavy metal musicians, we can't perform live at the moment. That's really the arena. So yeah. have you, is it one of those things where you've just sort of put it out there and whatever comes back to you, comes back to you like people like me. Uh, yeah, as I said uh, before, um, we weren't expecting anything. I mean, the label wanted to make 100 tapes and we were already counting our blessings if those 100 would sell. But now it seems to be a bit bigger than than that. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess we're just now waiting for uh, the reviews to come out because we know that some reviews are being written at the moment. And uh, hopefully we can uh, get some more interviews. It would be really nice to just mm. spread the word a little bit uh, th through interviews. But yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the, uh, as you said, nobody can play. Uh, we're all stuck at home. A lot of music is being released. So the competition is, is Absolutely. Yeah, it's insane. Um, so in the end, I, it's, it's something if you don't have a big PR budget, it's, it's difficult to push a release to an extent that everybody knows about it. So I, I just hope that we can get some good word of mouth uh, uh, advertisement and, and hopefully people will pick it up uh, uh, through that way because I mm -hmm. think that's the best we can hope for at this moment. So correct me if I'm wrong, there's no social media presence for the outfit. No. Yeah, uh, right. no, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Why is that? We didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't, didn't want to do it. it. <laughs> no, we, because we, uh, uh, René has his projects. I have my projects. Um, we, like I said, we did not uh, expect it to do very well. We didn't expect anything. So it was like, we, we have a project, check it out. If you like it, it's cool. If you don't like it, also cool, you know, but it's, yeah, it's been getting picked up, so maybe we have to do with something. Name? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but it's it's always difficult with, with uh, these type of projects. Also, for other bands uh, that I have, um, you got a Facebook uh, a page, and what do you do? You share a review, you share uh, the mm -hmm. artwork, but at some point, there's not much to share anymore. So then, basically, the Facebook page is dead, and that's always the, the difficult part with. Uh, the projects that I uh, that I work continuously on, uh, like Jenny Anderthals, it's different because we have a lot of releases and uh, sometimes uh, things get get back in stock and and we got some more fans, so people want to know about that stuff. And in that regard, uh, Twitter and and Facebook is is quite uh, comes in handy. But for, for a project like this, it's yeah difficult uh, also what do you get out of it because if you have a few fans on uh, uh, on facebook you post something and then you get three likes because nobody sees that stuff it all gets filtered out so yeah it's difficult 
Yeah, I know exactly. I know exactly what you're saying. So I appreciate that this the success. Of, let's call it what it is. It's a successful release, and that's been a bit of a surprise for you. And look, I can tell you, I've just finished university. I'm a journalist, a qualified journalist these days, but I majored in social media, and that shit is hard. Social media yeah. marketing and internet marketing is a dark art. And anybody who tells you they've got their head around it is lying because that stuff shifts quicker than they can rewrite the algorithm, you know, at Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and the like. And look, I've got to say, I just think it's an, it's a necessary evil overall. And, and your comments resonate, Renee, because I, I post a lot of stuff and I might get three or four likes. It's literally what you say, three or four likes. You know, I can see at times up to 5,000 people will listen to a podcast episode. So I know that I've got engagement, but I've in terms of people listening, but my people probably like your people like yourself people like us we're doers that's what i'm trying to say is we're doers so social media is just one of those things that we necessary evil uh, unfortunately yeah. but uh you know what do we do it's uh, it's here to stay <laughs> on the other hand I'm, i must say that um twitter is uh great to reach out to people directly and uh, also in the in the past uh, I've worked with uh, some people that I didn't know or that I thought were out of reach. But if you connect through Twitter and you see that you have a lot of common ground, uh, that can create a nice atmosphere. And um, so in, in that regard, Twitter is nice because you, it's not about the numbers. Like your, your post may, may not get 1,000 likes or whatever. But if one person reaches out and, is, and tries to tell you how much he likes the album or uh, wants to ask you a, a question directly on how it was recorded or whatever, um, that, that is kind of nice. I mean, it's small, but it's, it's really nice that people take the time to, and, yeah, to look you up and mm -hmm. try to connect. So in, the, in that case, I think Twitter is, is cool for that. Facebook and the other stuff, yeah, I don't know. It's just not working anymore. Fun fact for me is that Facebook is working really well for me and not Twitter. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, Facebook oh, that's, is... That's is, funny. is yeah. Because I have a studio, for some reason, people connect through Facebook, not on, not even a studio page, but on my, on my own personal page. Like, what do you want to do some stuff? Yeah, sure. So that's that's a whole different, a whole different approach. So Instagram, yeah. not that good. Twitter, not that good. But Facebook works really well for me, for whatever reason. Yeah, mm. it's funny. So it's, it's really no. funny. So it's, it's, I think it's really dependent. So I think if you are a musician, or you, then Twitter is better. But if you're more like a studio thing, company, so to speak, maybe Facebook works better. I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, I definitely find Instagram's about the only only way that I get cut through, believe it or not. It's Facebook does <laughs> virtually nothing. And I just cancelled my – I do have a professional because I'm a journalist. I, I, I've got a professional Twitter uh, account with like 20 followers or what have you, you know, I don't even look at it to be honest with you, but my scars and guitars one I actually canceled because I, I didn't believe in, re, in repurposing the same content across all three. And yeah, as yeah. it is, yeah, as it is, I just post on Instagram and just let it go through to Facebook and then just sort of fix up some of the social media tags and the at to make sure it goes through to the appropriate socials pages and the like. But um, yeah, Instagram by far is, is the number one, I think. What I do notice is that uh, every social media platform has its own audience. So it's, it's rarely cross-platform. Yeah. It's really, it's the Twitter audience, it's the Facebook audience, it's the Instagram audience. They don't cross-fade and they don't cross over. Yeah. It's kind of well, weird. I'm better make this my last question because I'm aware you've got to get on with the rest of your day. But I know it's early days and you've just released this, but I'd... I'd Love for you to say, yes, we plan on doing more releases like this in the future. So is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't um, plan anything yet. We had a yeah, exactly. small idea. So maybe we should do a second one. And, but that's all that was said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll let so, the dust settle on this one first. Yeah, yeah we don't want <laughs> to pressure ourselves because uh, the, the, the first record came out of... Uh, out of passion to make something cool. Mm. So the second one should, if we ever do a second one, it should be with the same intent, not because we had a yeah. good, great uh, first one. Let's do another one like the first, not gonna happen. We have to do something which feels good to us and that if it works, that's fine. If it doesn't work, well, too bad. Mm. Well, what can I say? 
it's a stunning accomplishment and it's a credit to you both for your partnership there, the music that you've created here. Long may you continue to uh, partner and create music. I can't wait for the next release. I'm sure I will not wear out this one because it's just so dense and layered and I'm finding new things with it all the time. So <laughs> lads, what can I say? Uh, you know, again, congratulations on it and long may you continue to work together and create music. Many thanks. No well, worries. thanks. And thanks for the interview. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, I guess we'll follow each other on Facebook for, from now on and uh, try to <laughs> like each other's posts. <laughs> four likes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I'll go from three to four likes or maybe five likes. Yeah, there you go. great. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I'll, what great. I'll do from here, lad. Well, there you go. That was the duo that comprised the Dutch outfit. Plague Organ, Marlon Walter Inc. and Rene Aquarius. Thanks so much, gents, for appearing on the show. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. I hope you've enjoyed both the podcast edit and that you've had time to check out the YouTube edition and vice versa, as a matter of fact. Until next time, take care. Thanks.